Do you? Yeah, yeah that's, that's my, my hot Is it? Oh, oh well, yeah. You've enjoyed this. You've enjoyed that. Yeah. I've really enjoyed this. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Have you done a lot of stuff? Have you done a lot of stuff? Yeah, and what happened to your co-advisor? I'm not in charge. I thought you were in charge. Oh, really? Yeah. It'll look badly on you if you can't find it. Really? Yeah. Why are you going? Yeah, he's just joking with you. See? See? What? Go try it. Go try it. See? That's good. I can actually say that. I can't see you. No, no, I'm not that. I can't see you. Do you spend enough time together? Yeah. 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 Y
and follow their missions using a geospatial perspective. So I have a lot of material to cover today and uh, hopefully you will find it interesting. But I wanted to start with sort of what I, what I see in the world oftentimes. And, and what I see is that medicine and health in general has had this real focus on all things small. And I think that it's possible that that fascination with the world of the small may have started around 1590 with the advent of the microscope. But, you know, the world of the small could get kind of tricky. So Joseph Lister, you know, he believed in these small microscopic organisms that could cause infection after surgery. And uh, people thought he was crazy, that he was insane. But it didn't take very long then. It, he became revered and a pioneer um, and ultimately the father of antiseptic surgery. So the world of the small wasn't always easy, but it was certainly interesting. And then, of course, in much more modern history, you have Watson and Crick uh, discovering the structure of DNA in 1953. And this is when I think there was this major change where there was like now not only belief, but money and effort putting put into things like genetics that could solve all health problems, right? If we just focus on genetics, it'll all be better. And I have to admit the power of genetics is undeniable. I wouldn't say anything bad about that science. It's perfectly wonderful as a science. It actually does many things for us. It can shape us in uh, many ways. The way we look, it compels us uh, certain behaviors, maybe it's our preference for sweet versus savory, or whether we're a lark or a night owl. Certainly our genes make us distinctive in important ways. But I think now we're at the point where sometimes we got to be lifting our eyes from the microscope and take a much more telescopic view of the world. And I think that that's a lot of what we do in GIS so that we can get a better understanding of the big picture, the context of our world. Because I think beyond every base pair, every family genetic pedigree, um, there are forces that uh, are more powerful than our medical care that influence our health in really important ways. And those forces are the environments in which we live, work, grow, pray, play, all of those different things. Those environments are really important to our, our well-being and, and our overall health drivers. Because even though they can't, um, you know, curb our cravings, uh, they certainly can craft our choices that we make. Our environments will not change the color of our eyes, but our environments change the way we see the world and our behaviors within it. So some people say your zip code might be more important than your genetic code when it comes to your health. I'm not here to make the argument one way or the other. I think they're both important, um, but certainly want to lay more recognition to our, our context. Because the first step for a diabetic person actually taking their medications is to be able to get the transportation to go and actually pick them up. Maybe people uh, don't want to eat unhealthy. It's not their will to eat better that is scarce, but actually their access to fresh and wholesome varieties of food. Uh, maybe that's where the problem lies. And you know, not every community needs to have a fancy gym at their disposal, but we do know that if communities have simple sidewalks, uh, that they can flourish. So I have certainly had the experience where I've recommended to a patient, hey, you need to get out and walk some more. And uh, Maybe I didn't know that this was their reality, that their walking was going to be on the side of a busy road where they could be subject to injury or the child could be subject to an asthma exacerbation from automobile exhaust, right? So with, when you don't know the con context, uh, you can't make the right recommendations. So we know that in health, we collect scads and scads of data points about all sorts of different things. But GIS, its importance and its value is in bringing all of those things into context so that we can see patterns and ultimately see the forest for the trees. And of course at Esri we call that the science of where and it is uh, what we use to make the world a better place we think, we hope. But it's not new, Esri didn't invent this. Um, this concept has been around for a long time. Hippocrates in 400 BC talked about the importance of place to health um, and the overall health outcomes that people experience. 
So it's certainly not a new concept. And so the title of my talk starts with the idea of gaps and overlaps. And when we think of gaps, a lot of times we're thinking of social determinants of health. And this is an older map. It comes from the Dartmouth Atlas Project, but I really like it because to me it shows one of the gaps that we see all the time, um, which is social determinants of health and, and how we think about that. So what you're seeing is a map of leg amputations per 1,000 Medicare beneficiaries uh, who had diabetes or peripheral vascular disease. Now when you think about why there is so much variation across the country, um, I mean one thing you may say in terms of variation is sure, I bet that there's probably more black people than white people getting their legs amputated. The rate is four to one when they did this research, but did you realize that the difference in leg amputation from place to place is 10 to one? So place matters. It's a very strong individual social determinant, um, and as you know, it's, it's like a factor in, uh, in many ways, uh, incorporating a lot of different social determinants of health. Now another area of gap I thought was really well shown in uh, a couple of maps I'll show you. Uh, maybe I'm just showing one I can't remember, but this is uh, around stroke. Now access to care for stroke is probably one of the most important kinds of access uh, you can have because the recommendation is to get to care within 60 minutes to get the preferred treatment. So if you can't get to care in 60 minutes, then you get secondary treatment potentially. So the dots on the map are uh, patients who had a stroke in this jurisdiction, they're VA patients, okay? So um, the two uh, hospitals are primary stroke centers of the VA. And then you've got uh, 15, 30, 45 minute and 60 minute drive times around those hospitals. So what you can see from this just initial analysis for their 24 hour stroke centers that the VA has all over the country, it only covers 18.3% of people who have stroke. So terrible 60 minute access uh, there. So certainly a gap and GIS is what they used to help them fill the gaps. They partnered with other hospitals um, to make sure that they got up to 85% coverage. So then you could also think of this idea of overlap and how it, it affects your decision making. So this is just a, a <coughs> hospital system in Chicago. And so uh, all of these black um, uh, locators are different uh, hospitals or clinics and you know until you zoom in and you know how far those are you might say maybe there's some overlap and they're cannibalizing their own business um, with two clinics but if you were to look at that map where might you put your next hospital or clinic I mean I'm guessing you're sort of spatially thinking in your mind kind of where there's empty spaces um, but you got to think about where's the competition too who's where are the other system hospitals in the region so that you don't overlap uh, with them unless you want to go directly head to head with your competition but maybe you want to fill another pocket of need. So gaps and overlaps are kind of the basics of, of what we do in GIS um, but it's so much more than that and so I really love this slide that uh, Jack often shows and, um, and I show it because I think almost any workflow that you guys are doing can fit into this, um, this category, this group of categories. So almost any project is going to have some need for data, right? So you need a system to be able to manage your data and integrate data from different sources. You know that uh, geography is a great data integrator um, outside of the system kind of integration as well. Visualization and mapping is often what people do so that they can start to have a better understanding of what's going on in their community, what their data looks like, if they have outliers in the data, for example. Then you get down to maybe you saw some patterns in that visualization and you can't help but ask why am I seeing those. So that's where you get into analysis of root causes. Um, so there's powerful analytical tools that can help you understand what's actually going on with your data. Once you understand the root causes, you're going to do some planning and design of interventions so that you can go out there and address those root causes. And that's going to help you with decision making on prioritizing your targets for the intervention. And then, of course, you're going to do your action, and uh, one thing that I think uh, a lot of us are doing more of, um, because we didn't do as much of it before, is measuring outcomes. Did you have the impact that you intended? And so my point in showing this is to make sure that everyone's minds are expanded to GIS isn't just the map or the analysis. It's all of this, and there are tools to support every level of this um, for your workflows. So. Um, and then I, I always uh, like this because to me it's, it's very academic um, as a justification for why I think about GIS. So this is showing 
the relevance for generalized knowledge versus relevance for immediate applications. And who doesn't like a two by two table? Um, but basically, you know, I mean, you can look at Thomas Edison. That was pure applied research, you know. He did everything so that you could use it immediately. And Bohr was all theoretical, right? This is pure science, putting it all together. But Pasteur, you know, vaccines and all that, he's doing the research and doing the applied work, um, creating something <coughs> that then can be used and works. So GIS is in that category, geography, spatial analytics, um, belongs there. It's got high relevance to understanding our world better and to applied interventions. Uh, much, must be why we all like it so much. So that was just the introduction. Here's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, I'm going to talk about a lot of things, but uh, I want to show you some applied ways that um, we've been helping organizations to use GIS. So focusing on opioids, then I'll talk about homelessness, and then in a way, I'm going to sort of combine these to talk about syndemics and other kinds of emergencies. And then I'm going to finish with, um, hopefully, an, a very interesting perspective on how to navigate HIPAA in a geospatial world. So let me start with uh, a quotation from um, Karen DeSalvo. As you may recall, she was the Assistant Secretary for Health and Human Services and the National Coordinator at the federal level um, in the last administration very bright woman and she and I were at a conference together and she said something that just struck me. She said, people today are dying from social diseases and we're not talking about STIs, social diseases. So I thought about that, what, is, what does she mean? And, and so I built my own story about what this meant. So I thought about kind of the history of health problems in the United States or any developing country. When we started out, it was infections, right? And then you had sanitation and vaccinations that helped us to overcome that. So infections weren't the primary killer of uh, the population. Then there were motor vehicle accidents and motor vehicles started to develop, you know, anti-lock brakes and airbags and all sorts of different safety controls so that we do better in motor vehicles. Well, then we sort of moved to developed country and chronic disease. And chronic diseases are quite a bit more complex than infections. Um, they last a lifetime. They need care management from multiple different kinds of care providers, generally all within the health professions. Um, but care coordination has been difficult for the health community to achieve. Uh, well, we're still trying to really crack that nut, I'd say. <coughs> Social diseases, what Karen DeSalvo is talking about, are diseases like substance uh, addiction and uh, homelessness. Those are even more complex. And this is the story that I think she's talking about when she says people are dying today from social diseases. And why it's so difficult is because these are more complex than even chronic disease and care coordination because now it's not just the health professionals that have to uh, contribute to the answer. With the social diseases, you have law enforcement, you have education, um, you have uh, government in several different areas. There are many different organizations that are participating trying to solve this problem that have never cooperated before. So this is uh, kind of my slide, why are social diseases so difficult to deal with? Well, they're difficult because of the communication and collaboration issue that a lot of times these are, are um, organizations or silos in which people didn't previously uh, talk as much. So you have to think about what does that mean for uh, data sharing and resource sharing and, and devoting yourself to a common goal. Then there is uh, being able to support data-driven decision making. So how do you leverage data you already have or get new data? What are the governance agreements that need to happen among these different organizations to make it work? I mean, these are complex issues in data security and other things that, that people have. So, you know, a lot of times we all wonder, well, why can't it just be better? Why can't people just work together? Uh, but it is complicated, and, and I fully recognize that. And, of course, costs for everything are rising, and I think particularly in public health, um, we are very mission-driven. We want to save the world. We want to help people. We want everybody to do better, and we don't usually measure it. We just do our job. Um, we got to measure it <laughs> because you got to be able to justify the resources that you're trying to gain to solve these more complex problems. 
And then, of course, uh, the one that uh, got to mention is stigma, right? Social diseases are complex because they're stigmatized, and people don't come asking for help all the time. They want to hide their problems. They're not openly discussed. So this is why they're so hard. Um, and then I, I, I thought that uh, David Satcher said very well that um, success redefines the challenge that, that we're facing. And what I think he means by that is, you know, you do well on something, but then the whole world changes. You know, you were getting used to chronic disease management, and now you've got social diseases. What do you do? Um, you may have been good at that, but you have to change the way you play the game. Um, you have to have a different approach to a different kind of problem. And uh, so I think we have, to, we have to be willing to change. So let me start with just some information on how we think spatially about the opioid epidemic. Um, and this is a, a, a beginning, and there's many things that I'm sure you could take from this and take it to the next level. Now, you probably are aware that uh, this is a, a public health emergency in the United States. Uh, among other countries, they have uh, problems as well. It's a trillion dollar problem. Um, and that trillion dollars is really measured from, I believe, 2007 to 2017. Um, and you could probably add another 500 million when you talk about time lost from work and other kinds of harder to measure costs. Uh, CDC has estimated that it's about $80 billion per year from starting at 2016 moving forward. So you get the point, right? It's a really, really expensive problem and it uh, affects all walks of life. So from June of 2017 to 2018, there were over 67,000 deaths. This is actually an improvement. Uh, the previous 12 months was 72,000 plus deaths um, from drug poisoning across the country. But when you, when you map it, I mean, you sort of already easily get to uh, develop a level of understanding of the seriousness of the problem. Now, when we took an approach, we, we thought about, um, and, and we're not the only ones, everybody's got their pillars to the opioid crisis. We had four. Um, I think HHS at the federal level has five pillars. We have four pillars. Um, our pillars are, are focused on improving education, right? Improving awareness about the issue uh, so that more people are inspired to take action and care about it and understand at least the, uh, the actions of government and other organizations. We look into accessible treatment. So where can people get treatment that actually need it? Um, how do we prevent people from uh, getting uh, these medications or from needing them in the first place? And effective response. So uh, a lot of times it's EMS, right, that's responding to overdoses or it's strategic decision making. So we thought about these different ways that GIS could help. So I thought I'd show you some examples. So for Esri, it actually all started with this gentleman, uh, Jeremiah Lindemann, and he works in our uh, Denver office. And uh, he was thinking about what could he personally do that would have an impact on this crisis. And so I'm showing you just a little bit of this map, but this is the whole thing. He created this crowdsourced story <coughs> map called Celebrating Lost Loved Ones. And people can uh, and any time, and any of you can go to, uh, it's now the National Safety Council, that's NSC, is, is owning this map um, and promoting awareness with it. Um, right now there's around 1,800 people who have contributed information. So a family member uh, or a friend can submit a picture and a story or a remembrance about their loved one that died from uh, some sort of uh, opioid overdose. And uh, so the reason that uh, my colleague Jeremiah was so interested in this is he lost his brother from the opioid epidemic. This is JT uh, Lindemann, his brother. Um, he was the first person to be put on the map. And JT loved sports. I mean, you can kind of see a twinkle in his eye. He was the kid who always got away with everything and didn't have to do his homework, uh, right? He was teacher's pet, um, had a family. He had a young child, um, but he struggled with addiction and lost his battle in 2007. And a lot of people think that that celebrating lost loved ones map is inspiring and great for building awareness, but some people feel like it's depressing. So somebody built the Hope Map. Um, and we love the Hope Map. So it's another crowdsourced story map, uh, but this is stories of recovery. So people who have entered some sort of um, addiction program or did it on their own, they're sharing their knowledge and wisdom. Um, and this guy says um, from Portland, Maine, 
just, I'm not anonymous, right? I mean, the whole point is we all deal with data and facts and figures, but there are people behind the data with real lives. And I think this is a powerful way to convey uh, the reality of this crisis. But there's so much more. So let me show you some of the different apps. And I think I'll stand over here so I can actually see my screen a little better. Um, this is a problem with age. You can't read anything anymore. Um, so I told you one of the pillars was education. So we have some apps that enable community education. One of them was we built this story map template. And any jurisdiction could put in their local data to start to share an awareness with the public. Um, I mean, you may have even heard, I cringed a little bit when um, the president talked about that this is a problem of young men. Uh, that's not true, right? It's the average age, depending on the jurisdiction, is in the mid to late 30s. Um, so you can share that information, what's going on with your community. We have apps to promote treatment and pain management options. So you start by catalog cataloging the resources in your community. So you could do resources in a number of ways. I mean, it, maybe it's uh, people who have not yet started opioids, and you want to give them resources that are alternatives to pain medication. So maybe it's acupuncture, massage, physical therapy, uh, yoga, meditation. I mean, there's a lot of different kinds of resources that people may be interested in. So you catalog them, and then you put them in a mobile app so citizens can find them, right? But if somebody's already addicted, it could be resources to help them find uh, chemical dependency uh, treatment centers. Okay, another resource that people use is sort of like, if you think of it as an economics problem, a supply and demand issue, um, how do you reduce the supply of opiates? Well, you know, you talk to prescribers, of course, but you get opiates out of people's medicine cabinets when they're done using them, right, and they didn't finish. Um, so expired and unused drugs, and we have drug drop-off locations for that. Um, so we built an app just to show the drug drop-off locations so people can get to them. Um, but then we took it to the next step because who picks up all of the drugs in those drop-off locations? It's the police. And so they can go in, and this is just showing that they went in, and week after week they weigh the contents so that you can tell if that drop box is actually being used. Um, and maybe that's an indication over time of you're improving the problem by getting more people to use it, or if it, the usage is going down, um, maybe you're improving the problem that way because people aren't holding onto their drugs anymore. So um, Walgreens is actually doing this, and they did a nationwide map showing all of their locations that accept unused uh, and expired drugs. Um, so we appreciated that they did that. And this particular program, I have to say, has been so successful um, since its inception. And I'm always amazed by this because I did, I've never dropped off medications. Um, so a lot of people don't do it, but enough people do it so that across the country, 10 million pounds of drugs have been dropped off, which is equivalent to the weight of 22 Statues of Liberty. Uh, so, so it's an interesting fact and figure, right? But think about what that means in terms of overprescribing. And these are just the people who chose to drop them off. We got a lot of it going on. Okay, so one of the interventions for saving somebody who's overdosed is to deliver uh, a reversal drug, naloxone. So we built some apps to help with that. So first is for law enforcement and EMS who may be out there uh, taking care of people who overdosed. So they can track what's going on. How many times did they administer naloxone? By what route? How did they find the person? Do they know what drug uh, they overdosed on? And what was the result? So when you track that information and you have the location included, you can make a lot of decisions from that. You can find out what your save rates are by police jurisdiction, for example, police uh, uh, beat or whatever you have. That may tell you where you need more training on how to use naloxone. You can also track where you're having more overdoses, which may tell you where you need to put more naloxone, right? Because you don't want to give, <coughs> you know, like five vials to every single jurisdiction. You want to put them where they're needed most. Um, so that's the uh, pattern to optimize availability of, of the drugs. You can think of it as a supply chain issue. Um, so there are apps to enable citizen reporting uh, or drug tips. 
So people, you know, we're trying to build awareness and get people involved, so how can they get involved? Well, people can use an app, and that app can, they can say, okay, well, I found a syringe at the park when I took my child for a picnic, or, um, I, you know, I saw two people exchanging something that looked like it might be drugs. Well, you can do that quietly on your app. You can note the location and send it off, and that information goes to the uh, authoritative organization that has to respond to any kind of complaints. Um, and all of that is done automatically. So in the, like for police, they will get, this one was drug paraphernalia that was found. They sent somebody to investigate and they were able to resolve the issue, but that can all be showed on the map and they can share their successes with the community. Like, hey, we got this many calls. We responded to, you know, 98% of calls, 2% still in progress. You know, we want to reassure you we're doing our job and helping. And then there are apps to manage uh, strategies and communicate to stakeholders. Um, so building this uh, authoritative data set on who's overdosed, like I said, anybody who's responding to that can mark it. Um, you can compare to other kinds of data like crime and outcomes, um, and then open data. Like I said, this is a, a problem where you have so many types of organizations and somebody's got to be uh, open and share their data so that uh, others can make use of it, and we all work from one authoritative source. And so if you ever wanted to look at some examples, if you were to um, Google Oakland County, Michigan and opioids, you would find that they've done amazing things and they've been doing it for a few years and you can see how they've reduced prescribing rates in their community. Um, they've done a really great job. And then there's the city of Tempe in Arizona. They've got this real-time map so you could, you know, if you're bored one day, put it up and watch it. Um, so every time an overdose happens, you'll see the map update. And uh, so you, they have this real-time information to show what's going on in their community. So I wanted to talk about another social disease, um, homelessness, um, particularly in California, particularly in LA, I mean, where you guys live. Uh, it's also bad in Sacramento, but I know it's not anywhere near the same as uh, it is here. Um, huge problem and a lot of political effort behind it now with uh, our new administration change in California to be better about uh, our approach. So um, if you're not somebody who already cares about homelessness, I thought I'd give you a few reasons to care a little bit more. Um, certainly this leads to children dropping out of school, right? So they end up not having the same opportunities to become educated and contribute to society maybe in the ways they would have if they had been able to stay in school. They tend to suffer from um, more ill health in different ways between uh, dental, physical, and mental health issues. Um, communities suffer from that lack of social interaction. People become isolated um, and aren't a part of uh, both the social fabric and the economic opportunities of a community. And then uh, nationally, of course, we know that people who are experiencing homelessness are going to have more interactions with police or the juvenile justice system. Um, and it becomes very, very <coughs> costly. So, and you've probably heard some of the reports uh, that say that um, many people are just one paycheck away from being on the street, <coughs> uh, which is pretty scary. I think the statistic is somewhere between 40 and 60 percent. So we started to think about how do you, how do you think about the analytics of homelessness? And so we built this model. I know it's a pretty simple model. Um, but we wanted to figure out where spatial analytics can have the most good. So we, we thought about first you want to, in any public health problem, you want to think about prevention. So that's what we did. We, in the top, we wanted to first predict where are people becoming homeless and then put resources in place to target prevention in those places. And then for people who are already experiencing homelessness, you need to aid and support them. So when you do that, you want to understand the characteristics of people who are homeless so that you can provide the right resources to the right place and then determine uh, how you would invest in new resources. So I want to show you a few of those concepts uh, spatially. So when it comes to prevention, we talked about you might want to model risk. And so we did that for LA County. So all of the maps I'm going to show you are LA City or LA County and it's all real data. Um, it is 2017 data, however. 
So we took a number of different variables that uh, could be related to homelessness, from people who were in poverty, uh, unemployment, having disabilities, veterans with PTSD, um, substance abuse, all of these things, and we ranked them by census tract across the entire county. So you get basically a risk surface here by census tract. So that's helpful, but then you can take it to the next level and say, okay, well, I'm just gonna pull out the highest priority communities where we had the biggest um, problem because it's where I might want to focus prevention. Well, that's all well and good, but that's still a lot of the county and you don't know what to do to prevent it yet. So that's where you put in what was the predominant cause of the homelessness um, for these areas. So the dark blue areas you're seeing are mostly veterans uh, that are homeless, mostly with serious mental illness or PTSD. The red areas and pink, those are uh, homelessness areas due to domestic violence. So if you're trying to figure out what to do to address homelessness, you're not gonna deploy, deploy the same intervention for veterans that you do for domestic violence victims. Um, they need to be completely different. So the idea is that resources aren't wasted by you know, doing a county-wide approach um, for everybody. So we put together, uh, you're probably aware that the Department of Housing and Urban Development does a homeless point in time count. Um, it was just done like last week um, all across the country. It's always done the first week of January. It's every year for sheltered homeless and every other year for unsheltered homeless. And it's always been done pen and paper. Um, so we just made a digital. We just took the HUD survey, put it on survey one, two, three, and now we've equipped a number of California counties with this mobile tool. Um, and what we just added a week ago is an automatic reporting tool. So as soon as you finish the survey, you can click a button and your report for HUD is done. So if you guys have any awareness of how long that usually takes for them to get it done, um, you'll realize we've decreased the <coughs> time lag there. And this, by the way, is one of my employees. I mean, we live this stuff, right? We can create a solution and then we go out and we volunteer and uh, help make it work. So one of the things that you can do when you've got this real-time digital data submission, you go out with the homeless point in time uh, survey, you survey somebody and you hit submit after each person. That goes directly to headquarters. You can have an interactive dashboard that shows your data. In this case, um, this is uh, a pie chart showing age groups, and maybe you wanted to focus on um, youth homelessness. So you had a, a philosophy that we're not going to keep any young people on the street one more night. So as soon as you want, you can click on the, the pie chart there, and you get targets around all of the youth that are homeless. Now you have their locations, and you can go out and immediately help them send services. We had uh, this exact situation in San Bernardino County for veterans, and they had a group there, a social services group, focused on veteran homelessness. Every time a survey came in, they deployed somebody to go to that exact location and get them off the street. So it was a hugely successful effort. So when you do that homeless point in time count, this is kind of what the data looks like. So this is LA County data by census tract, uh, again for 2017 with uh, graduated symbols larger showing more people. Um, I think it's not that interesting a map, um, but it's the raw data. But what can you do with that data and all of the underlying information? That's what I want to show. So the first thing is uh, maybe you want to look at it by congressional district um, because you want to build policy or get people more involved. And so now I can look and see that um, Karen Bass is the Democrat who's representing this district, and uh, while well, my pop-up is covering a lot of it, there's quite a lot of homelessness in that uh, eastern part of her district. So, um, and by the way, the Corpleth coloring on this map is the number of voters over the age of 18. So now we know their incentive and the problem all at the same time, so we could do some communication along those lines. Um, but we can do some other interesting things, and I don't know if you guys have started working with our bivariate mapping, but I love this stuff, I think it's super cool. So you have, you know, I mean, have you ever struggled with trying to map two um, variables that are polygons, right? It's not easy. Um, so we've got this color key here, and what you're seeing in this particular map is along the orange scale, we see the homelessness rate. So the number of homeless people per 100,000. 
Along the blue color ramp, you're seeing the actual numbers of homeless people. And so the darker color means you have a high rate and high numbers. So why is this important? If you have high numbers of homeless people, your intervention really needs to focus on providing services to the people experiencing homelessness. If you have a high rate of homelessness, you got to start focusing on prevention. There is something going wrong in your system that is causing more people to become homeless. So different interventions again. And in places where you have both, you've got to balance your resources and figure out what you want to do there. So these kinds of things can be very important for decision making. So we did another bivariate map. I liked uh, this one. Um, along the orange color ramp, you're seeing the total sheltered homeless. And along the blue, it's the total unsheltered homeless. So in LA, you can see you have a big unsheltered homelessness problem. No surprise there. So of your unsheltered homeless, um, what is the living situation? It's not everybody under a bridge or on a street, right? Living situations can be different. You've got people who are living in cars, vans, and campers. You have street homeless, tents and encampments, and emergency shelters, transitional housing, uh, safe houses, etc. So what we did here is it called a predominance map. And so the colors uh, represent your different categorical variables. What are the living situations? And the darkness of the color is the predominance of that situation. So I pulled up a pop-up so you can see that in action. Um, so in this case, you have 34 homeless people. 19 of them are in cars, vans, and campers. So that would be the green um, color. And 11 of them are in tents uh, and encampments and four in street homeless. So you've got quite a variety there, so it's a lighter green. If it was like all <coughs> cars, vans, and campers, it would be a darker green. So it's a way to kind of see your data in several dimensions at once. And then, of course, there's the statistical analysis. So this is, again, on sheltered homeless, and we're doing hotspot analysis so that we understand the statistical uh, significance. And so we can see that Santa Monica and Venice area, as well as central LA, uh, particularly Skid Row, which is in this area, is where you have um, statistically significantly more homeless people than would be expected given the rates in the county. Um, and that's important because you want to keep that in mind as you're trying to focus your resources. What's also important, and I want you to all never forget, is the blue areas, right? They have statistically significantly fewer homeless than everywhere else in LA. And you might want to ask, why is that? Do they have something in place that uh, you can mimic and, and uh, repeat throughout the area? So now for this next part, I wanted to focus just on the city of LA and veteran homelessness. Um, I really thought this was an interesting set of maps, sort of thinking about where would you put shelters for veterans, right? Because there's a lot of focus on, on uh, particularly solving veteran homelessness. So green areas are census tracts that have any homeless veterans in them. So it doesn't tell you anything about the amount, but there's at least one homeless veteran. Now from HUD, we got all of the shelters in the city. So those are the yellowish colored dots. Now, if you know anything about shelters, some shelters actually set aside beds for veterans. So those are the purple dots. So now you're starting to maybe, you know, mentally think about where's the mismatch? Do I have enough veteran beds given the veteran homelessness that I have? So then we thought about accessibility. So we built a 20 minute walk time around each of those uh, shelters that had veteran beds. And so now you get a really clear view of where you might have a need uh, for your veteran population. And, and if you had resources to spend on a shelter, uh, where would they go? Certainly in a, in a green area that doesn't have access. So like with the opioid uh, information that I shared with you, of course, for homelessness, you can also connect people to resources. And what many people may not realize is that at least 60% of uh, homeless people actually have a smartphone. Um, it's their lifeline. And so you could create apps of services where there are job employment programs and um, shelters and food pantries and uh, other kinds of retraining programs. So um, you could put that on a map and, of course, people could, would be able to find it and navigate there. Uh, other case scenario, I was talking earlier today, this, could, this app could be in the hands of um, the local churches or other places where people tend to go 
um, asking for resources and, and those people may not be fully aware of everything available in the community. Okay, so this last part of homelessness is the political part. Um, so one thing that we know is that uh, people have different agendas, right? And not everybody feels like you address homelessness in one particular way that's going to work. They have different ideas of how best to do it. And so my point in showing you what's coming is that you can use geography to build consensus politically. So we took this idea of homelessness in LA and we thought about all the different kinds of approaches people might have to solving it. So this first approach is based on the idea of social equity. And social equity basically says that if I have 1% of the population of LA in my census tract, that I should own 1% of the homelessness problem. If I own 5% of the population, I should own 5% of the homeless uh, problem. But that's not how it works. If you did social equity, um, what would happen, you know, uh, philosophically, is that places like Skid Row, those hot spots would break up, right? And people would be drawn to find resources in the communities, um, hopefully where they came from. So given that theory, the pink places are where you should put resources, given LA's data. Okay, this one's the hardest to understand. The rest are kind of easy. Um, so if you wanted to optimize access to resources overall, uh, again, the pink areas are where you would put them, but the idea is to put new facilities where existing homeless people already are. And I mean, it seems to make sense, but again, there's a lot of ways to approach the problem. Um, so that's where you would, would put your resources. Now, maybe you want to focus on high-risk areas, and we're talking about that risk map that I showed you before, um, where people are actually becoming homeless. So maybe you want to focus on prevention, right, and putting the resources in those communities or helping them to at least stay in their community if they do become homeless. So kids can stay in school and people still have their social uh, attachments. Another option is to centralize the resources. Now this is what San Francisco was uh, always doing. And that is to say they're kind of creating hubs. Like you already have several shelters in one area. Well, let's also put a veteran shelter. Let's also put a food pantry here um, so that it's one place where everybody knows to go. So that's a different kind of model, but pink is where you would put it, given that idea. And then what we call the street strategy. So this is to deal with the people who are really expensive, the people where you're getting a lot of crime complaints, a lot of 311 infrastructure calls for things like graffiti or encampments, code enforcement. Um, these are the really expensive people, right? And maybe your strategy <coughs> is to focus on that first so that you have the greatest financial impact and maybe you have resources left over uh, to work on everything else. So if you did that, again, the pink area would be it. So how do you put it all together? Well, it's easy. You overlay the maps. That's all you have to do. And then figure out how many uh, census tracts fit or how many objectives a census tract fit. So in this case, I'm showing you a census tract that actually fit four of the five different political agendas or objectives that I showed you. Well, heck, everybody could agree on that place. That's a great place to put resources, right? So you've now built consensus. Everybody's happy. Um, and you didn't even have to know statistics. OK, and, and I made the mention before that we should always try to track and monitor our progress. Also with homelessness, don't forget that we have operations dashboard available there. Um, in this case, we're sort of looking at chronically homeless and how that's going down over time. Um, the percent of chronically homeless, tracking on homeless veterans, hopefully seeing a decrease in the total number of days of homelessness. And then in the mapped area, I always thought this one's interesting. Um, so the blues are the number of homeless by census tract. So darker blue is more homeless. Then the spot is a shelter, and the size of the dot is the capacity of the shelter. And then in this case, we did a 30-minute walk time around that shelter. So this is Lancaster. So you can kind of see um, of course, there may be edge effects here, so I'd have to zoom out a little bit, but there may not be enough capacity in Lancaster given the number of homeless. Okay, so I promised I would sort of put this together uh, thinking about syndemics and, um, you know, outbreaks and that kind of thing are one type of emergency. Of course, there's 
uh, fires and, and other kinds of emergencies that public health respond to. But I thought I would focus on this one because we had such a, a pronounced example of that um, in one of the most beautiful places that I hope you all come to uh, over the summer, that's San Diego County, um, where they had a hepatitis A outbreak. And uh, if you know much about this outbreak, it was the largest hepatitis A outbreak that ever happened since the invention of the vaccine. I think actually they've had another larger one since then, but not San Diego, but another jurisdiction. There were 592 cases of hepatitis. There were more than 400 people hospitalized and 20 people died from this. Um, so big problem. So San Diego built uh, uh, this chart sort of showing the main reason I like to show it is that it took a year to get a hold, a, a, a handle on this problem. Um, and they did several things. Um, they had the first outbreak death, and they actually, it was after that that they detected there was an outbreak. They got help from the CDC. They piloted some vaccination foot teams and did hand washing stations. Um, and there was a statewide emergency. They did all these different things, and they used GIS throughout their whole process. So I thought I'd show you just a few examples. So one of the first things they noticed um, when they started to map this was that there was, uh, the outbreak seemed to be concomitant with um, homeless encampments. So the hexagons you see are homelessness and the purple dots are hepatitis A cases. So they thought, oh, that's interesting. And uh, so they started to think about what is the burden of disease? What are the correlations? And ultimately what they found was this was a true syndemic, that between homelessness and illicit drug use, it created a perfect storm for hepatitis A. So that really helped them to understand how they were going to um, intervene. Because one of the major interventions is vaccination. But their at-risk community is not a community that's easy to outreach to, um, to just, you know, put on the radio, hey, come get your vaccination, we'll do it for free, uh, just come to the local clinic. Well, these are people that are homeless and addicted to drugs. They're maybe not listening to the radio, they don't have transportation to get to the clinic, so you can see some of the problem. So, of course, they mapped it, and one of the things they mapped is where they should take a mobile team and a foot team to go out and vaccinate people. Uh, they went to the high-risk communities rather than asking them uh, to come to their offices. So they also wanted to think about where is this problem going to spread. Um, and of course, since uh, hepatitis A is transmitted through the fecal oral route, uh, hand washing is critically important. So they started to anticipate spread and put hand washing stations in different areas of the city so that people could improve their uh, hygiene. Um, they also, I don't, I don't know if you guys have ever seen this, and. I, you know, I don't know if this is the best thing to talk about for a public lecture, but um, in San Francisco, I have seen um, poop maps. I don't know if you've seen any poop maps. Um, but because of the homelessness problem, um, people have mapped where they found human fecal matter. Um, when you think about hepatitis A, I mean, this is a huge problem. It happens near encampments. It happens when people are addicted to drugs. Um, so San Diego also had that in mind when they figured out where to sanitize the streets and sidewalks with bleach. Because um, you couldn't do it all over the city, right? You're not trying to create panic or get people sick from, you know, fumes of bleach all over the whole city, but um, they were strategic in what they did. And you can read all about that in their after action report. It's on uh, their website and it's really interesting read the stuff they did. But GIS was an important part of their decision making at every step of the way. So, how am I doing on time? <coughs> um, we're going to go through uh, KIPA pretty quickly, um, but it's really important topic because HIPAA and geography don't naturally go together in some ways. So I loved what this guy Ohm said. Uh, he wrote in a paper that data can either be useful or perfectly anonymous, but never both because those are mutually exclusive concepts, um, which you may find, of course, at first depressing. Um, but it seems to be true in the reality that we face. So we care about this, though, because we know that population health improvement and um, our community health programs and all of these things really require high quality data and plenty of data to inform policy and decision making and all of that good stuff. 
So we also know that geography can add value. So you may not have all of the demographic information about the people that are in your study, but if you knew their address, you could get proxy variables. Right, so geography can help you with all sorts of things. Understanding that one address can help you understand all sorts of things about a person. So what is uh, HIPAA about? I want to give you a little bit of background. So it's all about appropriate protections of health information. And so what is health information? This is individually identifiable information. Um, and I, I put the full definition, by the way, on the slides so that if anybody wanted to, me to share my slides, you would have that, um, but I won't read it to you, I promise. But it's, it's being able to identify somebody's health information at an individual level. And I really liked, I saw this graphic somewhere and I copied it. It's taking health information and putting it with identifiers, and then you have a HIPAA situation or a protected health information situation. Um, if you only had health information and no identifiers, you're fine. If you have just identifiers and no health information, you're fine. Um, but unfortunately, what we want is both the identifier and the health data. So the privacy rule, the part of HIPAA that we care about that talks about protected health information, affects only covered entities. So who are covered entities? They're health plans, healthcare providers, and healthcare clearinghouses. So healthcare clearinghouses are like uh, organizations that do the billings and, and that kind of stuff, collect payments for health. And so it can be institutions, organizations, or just individuals, um, maybe a covered entity under HIPAA. And again, it covers mostly these ideas of billing, payment, insurance, and claims. The whole idea of HIPAA was to make health information portable so that providers and insurance companies could share it from one place to another and to help people um, transfer from one company to another with their insurance, right, uh, their insurance information. So that's kind of what, I, what it was all about, but it's been, I think, misinterpreted in many ways. So when you think about HIPAA and some of the things that I've personally seen people do wrong with geography, um, one of them is geocoding. So I thought I would give you the geocoding do's and don'ts. Um, so if you are geocoding protected health information, you know, my first warning is please be careful. Um, think about this before you go ahead and do it. So you can use your ArcGIS desktop software to do it um, if you have reference data on your computer. So reference data is that street data, either the Esri World Geocoder or StreetMap Premium. Not in the cloud, on your computer it has to be. You can geocode if you have an enterprise implementation of GIS and you've turned on what we call Portal. Uh, portal gives you the same protections within your institutional firewalls as your normal firewalls. So it's fully protected and you still have to have that reference data. You can't be going out to the cloud for it. You can also geocode in a HIPAA compliant cloud environment. That means using a, a private cloud like Amazon Web Services or the Azure cloud from Microsoft. Um, but you have to purchase, and many organizations do, a private cloud. Because a lot of places don't want to carry their own <coughs> technical infrastructure anymore and maintain the servers and all that. So, so they'll use this method. Um, you can do that. Um, I pointed out that we have a business partner called Spatialytics Health, and we asked them to stand up a, a HIPAA compliant cloud so that you can now buy a subscription and geocode your data in their cloud. Um, so that's now possible, and that's only been in the last eight months. Okay, so some don'ts. Um, so you may not give your data to anybody else to geocode. Like, oh, hey, you have access to a geocoder. Here's my, my protected health information. Don't do that. Um, unless you actually have a business associates agreement, which makes you basically a covered entity, so you will be subject to all of the legal uh, restrictions and penalties if you do something wrong, um, or you are approved under an IRB. Right? Those are the only reasons that you should be handling somebody else's data. Um, and you can't geocode protected health information in ArcGIS Online unless it was deployed in a private cloud. And most of you aren't doing that, so consider it unsafe. So you also have to think about geocoding in general. I mean, geocoding accuracy, um, getting accurate data, is really all about the underlying reference data. 
So when you think about um, other products and, you know, I mean, I, we want you to use Esri, of course, but if you use other products, that's fine, but make sure you have quality reference data. Otherwise, you're already obfuscating your results in some way. Um, they won't be accurate if you don't have accurate reference data. And you also have to be aware of your geocoding match rate. Um, so don't just trust the result. If you said, you know, match if the address is 50% right, um, you're going to get low quality data. So you can adjust some of those parameters, and I just wanted you to be aware. Now, in terms of de-identification under HIPAA, um, basically what I see a lot of organizations do is they say, okay, well, we're just going to follow Safe Harbor. And Safe Harbor um, was developed in Europe and was really meant to focus on uh, privacy related to commerce. But basically they said if you remove 18 types of identifiers, then no actual knowledge or residual information can be put together again to re-identify an individual. If you take away those 18 identifiers, <coughs> you are good to go. And a lot of people will use that because it's really easy. These are the 18 identifiers. Um, you'll notice one of those is geography. So let me get really specific about what is, is in geography, and, and you can look at the other ones. They're pretty obvious if you have a device and it's got a serial number on it that's implanted in you or any other kind of biometrics. Um, so, so geography under Safe Harbor, um, it applies to anything smaller than a state. Um, and then if it's smaller than a state, you have to figure out how many population are in that jurisdiction. So basically anything smaller than 20,000 people is off limits for HIPAA. So in California, we have eight counties with fewer than 20,000 people. So think of county health rankings, for example. You've seen those. Are they violating HIPAA? I'll tell you in a minute. Okay, so overall though, 10% of all U.S. counties have more than 200,000 residents, and more than 40% of counties, and this is the problem, have fewer than 20,000 residents. So again, you know, when you see the CDC put together a county level map of the whole U.S. of some health issue, um, are they violating HIPAA? And the answer is no, and it's because they took the other route. They weren't doing safe harbor, they're doing expert determination. And expert determination is what gives you all of the flexibility. It was, it's what makes geographic analysis really possible. So you apply statistical and scientific principles so that you have a very small risk of re-identifying an individual. Note, it doesn't say perfection. You don't have to be perfect. You have to use uh, the best standards and guidelines so that it's a very small risk. Okay, and if you have de-identified data like that, then you can use it anywhere. You can publish it, you can share it online. It's de-identified, it's safe. <coughs> so a lot of people use different rules to uh, make expert determination easier because not everybody's got a statistician at their behest who can do it every time. So I thought I'd show you what some of the experts do. So the numerator rule really looks at the number of cases that you have of whatever you're looking at. So CDC, the wonder database you've probably used before, um, they will suppress any cell with fewer than 10 observations. The National Environmental Public Health Tracking Network uh, goes from zero but less than six CMS, which I think a lot of people follow, if they have fewer than 11 observations, then they suppress the cells, um, but 11 and more is okay. Um, the range of all the experts we looked at in, in Health and Human Services was 3 to 40, but most fall into 10 to 15. So you could probably say if you had more than 15 observations, even if it's a rare disease, you're probably okay. Well, it probably wouldn't be a rare disease if you had that many. Okay, so suppression of small cells on a map, what does that look like? So geographic masking to suppress small cell counts is done in a couple of ways. So you actually have to suppress complementary cells. So I want you to pay close attention to the legend here. So in this case, we're masking anything under 10 observations or under 11. So the right categories are here, but if you just took your 1 to 10 and hashed it and then showed 11 to 39 and 40, etc., you'd know where the cutoff was. You'd still know that those other cells were 1 to 10, right? So complementary cells means that you're masking it. So here it just says under 40. It doesn't say where you started, 11 to 39. So now you have masked the complementary cells and your small cells to suppress. So hopefully you see how that one works. Then there's the denominator rule. So that's the underlying population. 
uh, in your study. So some of the experts, uh, you see a wide range here from the Maine Integrated Youth Health Survey, 5,000 is good enough for them, up to uh, 250,000 for the National Center for Health Statistics. So when it comes to geography and the denominator rule, the um, risk definitely varies based on the level of the zip code and how that zip code is combined with other variables. For example, if you have somebody's date of birth, their sex, and their five-digit zip code, that is unique information for more than 50% of the country. So more than 50% of you could be identified if we had that information about you. But if you just combine some things and you had year of birth, sex, and a three-digit zip code, that turns out to be unique for 0.04% of the U.S. residents. So that's pretty well anonymized. So one way that you get to that level of anonymization is aggregation. And I'm sorry, I'm over. I'm almost there. Um, so you can aggregate your cells on any variables that you wish, um, combining months to years or days to months. Uh, that helps. And you can also combine your polygons in different ways. Um, so here you're seeing an example of polygon combination, but you could manipulate your latitude longitude. You could truncate it or change the last digit to move the points a little bit. You could use alternate boundary types like a uh, fishnet grid or hexagon grid and don't use um, political boundaries. All of those are going to help to aggregate your, ways in the, in, your data in ways that people won't uh, re-identify. You can also do blurring. So blurring helps you to um, to make the data just a little bit less specific. So in this case, you do categories instead of a continuous variable. You can, instead of doing this, you could say less than or more than the statewide percent, right? Or do high, medium, low, something like that. Nobody has the numbers. Or you can do like they did at the top and combine three years of data. All of that is considered blurring, but you still get the message across that you wanted to share. And then perturbation, I talked to a few of you about this. This is the idea of geomasking. It's taking a point and moving it to another location that preserves the patterns in your data that you, you may want to analyze. So you have masked the individual but preserved your patterns. And to do this properly, you focus on an outcome called a case statistic. And then you can take that statistic and decide for your organization if it meets your anonymization standards. And NIH has standards for that that you could look at. OK, so I'm just going to breeze through this. I, I will make these available. But there are organizations like in South Carolina that use numerator or denominator. And if you use either one of those, you're OK. Or the California Department of Healthcare Services <coughs> says no, you have to meet both numerator and denominator rule. And what they do is if you don't meet those rules and you're into expert determination, they have a scoring criteria. So they've created this whole scoring system for your data. And if you meet the scoring criteria, then you, know, you have to go through some other legal, policy, programmatic work. But you're good. You don't need a statistician. So this is how they score things. Um, and I thought this would be interesting to you. And I'm sorry there's not more time to talk about it. But if you wanted to look at age ranges, say, of one to two years, you get a higher score, and you want to keep your score low. Um, so if you widen your age range to 10 years, your score lowers. So if you did 10 years, but a more refined geography, you might be in the sweet spot. Right? you got to stay under 12. So they came up with this system. They tested it on a lot of data. But it allows you to make the decisions. Like maybe the most important thing is to look at the ethnicity and the geography. But maybe it's to look at the age group and uh, the gender. I don't know. You can make the decision. OK, so hopefully you are convinced that location intelligence is applicable throughout the entire workflow. It does help you make better decisions. And, uh, but I do know that we're human. right? It can be really hard to change. Um, and it's been said that everybody loves to innovate, but nobody likes to change. Um, but I will remind you that status quo is the enemy of innovation. So hopefully I've helped you to unlearn something today. Um, and if you think it's hard, I know it is. But I thought I'd inspire you by Alan Turing, um, because he was able at, to figure out the Enigma machine that had approximately 159 quintillion possibilities. If he can do that, can't we solve some of these simple problems that are facing us? 
um, with social diseases and using uh, <coughs> geography in a HIPAA world uh, or HIPAA in a geographic world, um, I think we can do better. So hopefully that inspires you and thank you for staying a little later and paying attention. It's been a pleasure to be here. So we have a wee reception or something, do we? We do. Whereabouts? Uh, right across right here. So okay. if you can hold the little Q&A, please go ahead. Okay. Thank you, boss. <laughs> uh, does anybody have a question? Sir? Uh, it might be slightly off topic, but on the slide where you were talking about identifying uh, risk factors uh, to map the homelessness situation, um, so how long did it take uh, you from kind of getting the idea to map that to actually collecting relevant information so that you can display it? Actually, all of the information was collected for the annual homeless point in time count. So it was a part of the regular activities. And then um, uh, we have a spatial statistician at Esri. Many people may know her. Her name's uh, Lauren Scott Griffin. And uh, our team had been working on some of the mobile apps and all of that, and she wanted to work on the spatial analysis. So she dug into those data because uh, you guys know our president, Jack Dangerman, and he's friends with Mayor Garcetti, and everybody got together and shared data. And, and so that's how we started working on it. But she put that, uh, all of the analysis that she did together in, um, I'd say, a couple months. And here's the best news. You guys can all do the analysis and have access to the data because it's a, an online lesson. So if you go to learn.arcgis.com and look up homelessness, you can do all the same maps and analysis. Yes? I have a question for you. Thank you. This is an amazing talk. Um, I would love to hear your thoughts on GPS data, like geolocation tracks of individuals and in, in the HIPAA world. Obviously, it's a disaster, <laughs> but uh, do you know of any work or any kind of uh, conceptual rules around how to handle that in visualization? Yeah, so I mean I think some of it is volunteered information. So if you're getting information actually on a patient, um, like with Fitbits, people are volunteering their information all the time. So that would be a normal consent form. Um, sometimes it's not HIPAA, right? There are um, like emergency situations where HIPAA is not relevant. It's not covered entities, right? It's police force and public health personnel. Um, so you can use it for that. And then we were thinking about things like we have a new product coming out called Tracker. And Tracker not only shows your GPS location at the time, but the breadcrumbs of all of your previous locations. So we talked about things like could that be used to help with the homeless point in time count? So you could see where people have been and where they've collected information on the surveys. There's nothing private about that. So I think there are ways to do it, but you certainly have to be careful if you're tracking individuals. They need to be either consented or volunteer. So do you know if the homeless count um, that happen every year, especially in LA, they're now using the survey one, two, three? Or so this I, is just for a special occasion? I thought that LA was using survey one, two, three. I'm not 100% sure, but I know that um, I mean, LA's got our software, a lot of it, but uh, San Bernardino, Riverside County, Orange County, um, uh, Imperial's going to, uh, a lot of them used our software this year for the first time completely. Last year we did a uh, dual pen and paper with the mobile device just to do side by side um, in Riverside and San Bernardino, but they went fully digital this year. And for the San Diego data um, of hepatitis A outbreaks, where did you guys had access to that data? <laughs> Is it San Diego's county who did it, or what, or did you guys collaborate it? Because I mean, I'm trying to get data in LA for the hepatitis outbreak that happened in LA, which is why I ask you about how did you? Yeah. So it is San Diego's out? data, um, and their maps, and they were, you know, I will say that they were a little nervous up front, which is why yeah. they created the homeless encampment data as hexagons. Um, and they, you know, zoomed far out. There's no way you could tell where those hexagons really were in terms of, you know, streets or boundaries. Um, so that was more of a cartographic trip trick, right, than a, a statistical method of addressing HIPAA. Um, so 
I mean, I know that they reported cases up to the Department of Public Health, and they put those cases on their website, but they only put them for the whole county. So you'd have to go to San Diego to get the data. Other questions? Okay, so maybe we could say thank you one more time. The requirements to be successful.